Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Have you ever considered that some of the best leaders in history had vastly different personalities and leadership styles? Think of General George Patton and Gandhi, for example. Both are considered highly influential leaders, yet they were so different in their approach to leadership. My guest today has been thinking about these things. Stephen Mays is a former nuclear submarine officer who spent his career leading technical people doing difficult things. He argues that it's not about personality or style, it's what the leader does that matters. And he's built a visual model to help us think about the things leaders need to do to be effective. This is an interesting way to explore leadership, and I'm excited to hear more about it. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today I'm joined by Stephen Mays. Stephen is a former nuclear submarine officer who served on the USS Los Angeles. And for those of you who know your history, this was the first boat in the famed 688 class of nuclear attack submarines. After the Navy, he spent most of his career leading technical teams in the nuclear power industry. He is the author of The Power of Three, Lessons in Leadership, where he explores the things that leaders need to do to be effective. I'm excited to have another former submarine officer on the show today and to learn from his unique perspective. So Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about how you ended up in the first place on a submarine uh, as a junior officer. Why did you choose that career path or was it chosen for you? How did you end up in, in submarines? Well, I... Um I took my first class cruise uh, when I was at the, at the uh, Naval Academy, and I went on the USS Hawkbill. I met her up in Bremerton. We went up to uh, Vancouver in that area to do torpedo shoots, and then we came back down to San Diego and did some operations down there. And the crew and the officers and the captain were so fabulous, and everything just was so wonderfully well done. Um, and I got put as a junior officer of the deck uh, right away and was driving ship. And, and so it was really quite exciting for me. And I got time to spend with the captain to talk to him about what was important. And so I felt like everybody there was invested in me. And that's the way I wanted to have my career be. So I, I chose nuclear submarines. Okay. And at the time, to, to get into the nuclear power program, you had a chance to meet at the famous Admiral Rickover. And for those who don't know, uh, back then, he would personally interview every officer that was going into the nuclear power program. So you actually got to interview with Admiral Rickover. Is that right? Well, that's right. I, um, I unfortunately don't have any great stories to tell, from <laughs> ex- except that I probably had the shortest interview on record. Okay. Which uh, basically he asked me three questions, one of which he tried to get to bait me into something. And I just rolled my eyes and shook my head and said no. And, uh, and then uh, he said, okay, that's all. And the captain got up and said, you're in. And I walked out. So uh, I, it, was, it, was, it was very bland. Uh, but I was with Rick Rover several times after that. As six, he went on every sea trial we went on with the 688 because they were testing out a lot of new material and a lot of new equipment and a lot of new sound dampening and things. So I got to see him about four more times. And of course, wow. when we went out with President Carter and, and, and Rosalind Carter, he came down and went out with him So for that. So I probably saw Rick over about five or six more times after uh, my interview. And each time he would come in and start his more or less famous kind of agitating things going on. And I would roll my eyes and to look away and then he'd stop and move to another target. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some famous stories of, uh, of people interacting with uh, Rick over, over the years. So it's and, actually and probably, all, it's probably good that they're, they're all, all true. true. <laughs> yeah. It's in, in, and they see, they keep get they keep getting wilder over the years, I think too. So, <laughs> so you had a short interview with him, which is probably good. Yes. Yeah, so it worked for me. 
So what was your experience like? Um, you know, we, 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 we did it in the intro. We talked about being on the Los Angeles and, and that was the first ship in the 688 class of fast attack submarines. It ended up being really the, 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 the war horse of the fleet for, for decades. And, but you were the first, you were the first, uh, I think you were a plank owner, if I'm not mistaken. So you were the first crew to get this brand new technology, brand new ship. What was, what was that like? being on the first of something like this? Well, it was really interesting. Uh, we were in the shipyard, so I was there from new construction. Uh, when I first got there, there was nothing forward of the reactor compartment, really. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, I was there for the first criticality of the uh, S6G reactor. I was there for the first, uh, all the sea trials um, and the commissioning and uh, first operations and deployment to the Mediterranean coming back to the shipyard for post-shipyard availability, which was exactly backwards how most people did it. <laughs> yeah. um, they did sea trials, then they went back to the shipyard, and then they did, went on deployment. We went on deployment right away. As soon as we commissioned, it was you were, you were going out, and we did. And we were wildly successful at the things we were asked to do, especially in anti-submarine warfare issues and uh, uh, tracking and uh, working with the uh, uh, carrier. So it was... a uh, interesting thing. And we did an awful lot of work down in the, the sound trials to uh, examine what our uh, sound signature was and to determine whether or not other submarines could detect us and whether mm. or not we could detect them. Uh, so it was really interesting. We had many times down in the Bahamas, down to St. Croix, went through the Panama Canal to go to Honolulu for our, our eventual home port, made runs in the Pacific North, uh, made runs to the Indian Ocean, uh, so, uh, it was a lot of different things going on and there was always something busy and exciting and new to do. Mm. So it was, it was, it was really interesting because when you see the things getting built and you were part of initial testing and stuff, in addition to going out to sea and having to operate them and then fix them if they break or deal with them, it's uh, it gives you a different perspective from just showing up on an already built boat and then having to under try to find out what it's about and how to operate it. Uh, right, right. We got to see everything go in from the bottom up. And wow. it was really, it was really uh, quite a unique experience. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah. I showed up to the Tennessee and she had done, you know, done all her sea trials. She was ready to go when I showed up. So all we did was spend time at sea. So I didn't get to enjoy some of the seeing it built, but I got to be the first uh, uh, wardroom of an act, you know, an active submarine. Brand new, still smelt like uh, fresh paint. So, <laughs> so um, just tell me a little bit about, like, I mean, you you you've written on leadership. We're going to talk about your book here in a second. But what were some of the leadership lessons you learned living, you know, le living and leading on a nuclear submarine, especially in a situation like you had, you had a brand new boat, you were traveling all over the place, everybody's watching you guys because you had to, you know, they wanted it to be a success. So what, what kind of leadership lessons did you learn uh, during that time? Well, I think the thing that impressed me the most uh, was the, the quality of some of the uh, chief petty officers I had to work with. And I mentioned before, my uh, IC chief petty officer was an amazingly marvelous guy. Uh, I remember calling him in my stateroom when he came aboard and I said, look, you know way more about this stuff than I. I will tell you what's expected of me. And you tell me what you need. And if you keep me informed so that I know what happens before the captain knows what happens, then I'll keep you informed so that you know what's coming down the pike before the cob tells you. Mm. And well, everything will just be fine. I said, you've got their liberty cards. You've got their training things. You take care of them. And I'll help take care of you. Mm. Uh, and so that's what we did. And we had a very good mutual operating uh, environment. I had some uh, interactions with some senior uh, people who were less than stellar. Uh, and I had some interactions with some guys who were really terrific, like Frank Kelso, who was my squadron commander mm. um, when I was in Pearl, uh, who later became CNO. Uh, so I got to see a range of different uh, people who were great leaders and some that were not so great leaders. And it always puzzled me why these things were happening. Mm. Uh, and then when I got out of the Navy and worked in the uh, uh, the private industry, I saw the same things happening. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a uniquely a military situation. It was any kind of uh, hierarchical authoritarian organization seemed to have these same things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so 
Uh, I went to work for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for about 11 years, and that also had similar things. So I spent time thinking and studying about leadership, and then I finally had a friend convince me to write a book, so I did. And the biggest thing I did was I said, what can I come up with as an, a person who's been an analyst and experienced leadership? Because my technical background is math and engineering. Where's my model? Where's my formula? What's right. what's going on here? Right. Where, 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 where are things the same and where are they different? Mm-hmm. And then it began to dawn on me that the people that I really admired, that I really liked being around, weren't ne- as leaders, weren't necessarily the people I liked the most. Interesting. I mean, Rickover was an asshole. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but he was doing it for a purpose, and I knew what the purpose was, so it didn't bother me so much. Mm. Uh, and I knew what he was doing was so vital and important, and I know he was doing it very well. So that's what I started, that kind of started getting the juices flowing. Um, and then I noticed uh, when I saw really good leaders that they all seemed to do certain things, and the really poor leaders all seemed to either not do them or do them poorly. Mm. Uh, and then it began to dawn on me that style and personality are not leadership traits. They are personal traits, but they're not things that are crucial or necessary for, for leadership. For example, nobody could claim that, uh, that uh, Mahatma Gandhi, George S. Patton had anything in common from a sta- standpoint of style and leadership right. and, and personality, but they were both great leaders right. and nobody would compare Churchill with Mandela and get the same answer. Right. And nobody would compare MacArthur and Martin Luther King Jr. and say, yeah, those guys had the same personality and style because they just didn't. Right. So if you could be a great leader and have such widely divergent personalities and styles, it couldn't be because personality and style was all that important. So then I started looking at it, and, and the more I looked at it, the more things got simpler. Um, and that's what I'm up with the... Uh, concept of the power of three because I, it, it became obvious to me that the good leaders did certain things and mm. the poor ones didn't and that's how that uh, paradigm picture that's in the book and, and the information i showed you came about because i started looking in things everything just seemed to coalesce around certain certain principles and certain lessons mm. and so that's why i ended up writing the book it was almost a uh, uh self-defense slash self uh self-enlightenment journey for me right but then when i have children and they're going they're going to school they're playing sports in college and and in high school and i see uh, my wife's a teacher and i see those kinds of environments and i kept seeing the same things happen over and over again Mm. the people who didn't do the things that were in my paradigm were the ones who were struggling and the kids who were trying to work for them had difficulty working and being successful for them so it became just it's become a self-realizing thing where every time I look at it, it keeps coming up with the same answers. Mm. And so I, it's gotten to the point where I, uh, I can't even think about leadership without the, you know, instantaneously thinking about that picture. Mm. You know, there's no, there's no story that says uh, how you tell whether or not somebody understands something is you do something like this. You say, whatever you do, do not under any circumstances, Think of an elephant. <laughs> and what did you just do? <laughs> yeah, you thought elephant. of an elephant. <laughs> once you see this paradigm, I guarantee you, once you see this paradigm and you look at it, and you spend the least amount of time you have on it, and a leadership topic comes and the, the, the thought leadership goes in your mind, you will not be able to escape seeing that picture in front of you. Because it goes right to a place, right it to goes a place right in Right to that, a in place that yeah. in that drawing. And the beauty of it is, you can see what you need to do as well as you can see when things aren't going well, what's going wrong. Okay. So yeah. That you have an opportunity to do something about it. And so that's what I was really hoping for was to be able to give something that young leaders and young people could see and get and do to help them up to be better leaders without having to get kicked in the teeth, knocked around, or just by plain dumb luck, having it work out for them. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting. So it's almost as if um, your technical background 
actually led you to a place where you were looking for almost an equation or almost a, a, a systematic way to look at leadership in a way that probably hasn't been done. And, you know, you, you think about, you know, it's 15,000 books been written on leadership, right? And, and I think it's, we've approached it from all different angles, but I think you said, I think something that's really powerful, which is it's not necessarily personality and style, right? It's what the leader actually does. And I think that's what makes your book unique is that you're talking about the actual, what does a leader sh- leader do? What does a leader have to do to be effective, right? Absolutely. And uh, every time I every time I have the, this conversation when somebody something comes up, I'm always astounded that the same things come up, and they always come up in groups of threes, mm. uh, which is uh, kind of you know they, they always just say the joke about uh, you know uh, tragedies happen in, in threes and. There was a old joke used year about when uh, people smoked all the time is you never wanted to have three on a match. When you're ah. lighting a cigarette, you could only go, you could only do three more than three on a match was was a no no. Uh, uh, baseball, you have three 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 strikes and you're out. Three right. outs and you have to take the field. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of. Uh, if you're a Christian like I am, you have a God that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's three. All yeah. Uh, so you see, it, and in the military, you have the all the communications were uh, command, repeat, three. acknowledge. Yep. So I kept seeing every showing up in groups of threes, and I couldn't get away from it. Uh, so I said, no, maybe there's something here. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And so your book, uh, your book is called The Power of Three Lessons in Leadership. So what are these three leadership elements that are in the book? Well, the first thing is a foundation. You can't build anything without having a foundation, a house, okay. a building, a reputation, uh, a career. You have to have some foundation. And so that's the, the first part. The second part I looked at was once you have a foundation, what are the major challenges? What are the problems you have to be able to successfully handle in order to continue your leadership development and be successful? And I found that, that to be a, a group of three things. And then beyond that was if you can handle the challenges and you have a foundation that's good, mm-hmm. what are the things you do beyond that to enable you and the people and the organization you're working with to achieve? Because mm-hmm. that's the ultimate goal of leadership is to achieve something. And I found another group of three things that seem to always characterize and, and, uh, and make that stuff up. So that's the way I organize the thing. Um, and it's, uh, I have various lessons and stories in the book and then on the website about each one of those elements. Um, the one I like to cite the most is about the foundation because I have three things, honesty, courage, and talent. And of those three things, talent is the least important, but it's the one we spend 99.9% of our time on. Yes. And I always, try to bring this home by asking the following question. Did Richard Nixon resign the presidency because he lacked talent? Mm, No. Did Bill Clinton lose the House and Senate to the Republicans for the first time in 50 years, lose his law license and pay out a million dollars in settlements in a court case because he lacked talent? Yeah, no. All right. Now, 1974, I graduated and up in New York on the Plains of West Point, another guy graduated in 1974. And he became the most prominent strategic and tactical leader that the Army has produced since Eisenhower and Patton. And my question is, did David Petraeus resign from the CIA as director because he lacked talent? Yeah, no. And the answer is no. Yeah. So then my question is, well, if we have catastrophic failures of leadership and they're not due to talent, why is it we are not working on people's honesty and courage. Mm, I, I asked them, what did you get in your honesty 101 exam? Mm. What did you get in your capstone project on courage? And everybody goes, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and they could tell me what grade they got in their class or statics and dynamics class or electrical engineering class or whatever class. They can tell me those. I said, but nobody was getting any formal education on how you went about the honesty and the courage part. Mm. And so I said, that's got to change if we want to have better leaders. And it has to change early mm. because you, when, you, when you're 40 years old and you think you know everything now because you've been promoted all the way up the chain, uh, it's a little late to be working on those things. Right. 
So I think I think honesty is pretty clear um, what that means. But um, t- talk to me a little bit about courage. What is what is courage for a leader look like? Well, courage I define in the book as three things: overcoming fear, to take actions to help somebody else without regard to the cost to yourself. Mm, that's that's the def- That's the definition of courage. Now wow. it can take really extreme forms, like jumping on a grenade. Right, right, right. Or, or it can take really simple forms. And the, the example I give in the book is one of my daughter who would come home from school not, not having eaten her lunch because it turns out when they went to the, to the uh, lunchroom, there was a kid in her class who was always had separation anxiety and he would cry during lunchtime. Well, they had been put in the lunchroom and told to sit in one place, be quiet and eat your lunch. But this kid was crying and my daughter would get up every day and go over and sit next to this young man and talk to him during lunch ter- period so he would stop crying. And then when the teacher came back to get him from the lunchroom, she'd run back to her seat and sit down, and she hadn't eaten anything. Mm. And we didn't find out about this until we asked the teacher to you know, go spy on what was going on. And I had to tell my daughter how proud I was of her for being willing to overcome her fear of disobeying the teacher, go help her friend, and do so without being able to eat her lunch. Mm. So she was giving me a demonstration of courage a child, a first yeah. grader, was doing yeah. this. And I began to realize there's a lot of people demonstrating courage all over the place, but if we don't, we don't recognize it, we don't celebrate it, we don't promote it, we're not going to get much of it. Mm. And that becomes the problem. Yeah, I, I see your point. I mean, I definitely, you know, um, one of the things I talk about is that I see too many leaders in it for themselves, right? They're in it for their own personal glory, the paycheck, the corner office, the company car, or what have you. So, they're they're off working on their own uh, personal self and, and and being able to achieve something for themselves. So when it comes to making a decision that that requires courage, right? They would never take that decision. Uh, she, they'd only take any decision that would affect them positively for their career. So they would protect. So the bad news would get hidden. The good news always goes up. So they can try to get promoted, get to the next. So. What you're saying about true leadership, it is, is making those decisions, even though it could possibly, it's, it's not going to benefit you. It's, it's the, the right decision to make for the organization, for the people of the organization. Exactly. And yeah. you, you find an awful lot of people uh, in military and civilian and government situations uh, who are just either incapable or unwilling to display courage. Mm-hmm. Now, honesty is the part that's a little bit different in the book. I, okay. des- I describe honesty in the following way. I, I kind of take a page out of Scott Peck's book, uh, The Road Less Traveled. Honesty is seeing the world and your situation in it the way that it is. Mm. Not, not the way you want it to be, not the way it could be, not the way it should be if those idiots who are in charge are just do things <laughs> your way. Right. See it the way that it is. Because if you can't see it the way that it is, how can you formulate plans and uh, methods of making it better or going forward. You mm-hmm. have to see things the way they are so you can see how you can move them to the next place. If you're not, it's the old joke that uh, if, you, if you care where you're going, any road will get you there. Right. And if you don't know where you are, any road will get you there. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So that's another thing that, you know, as a characteristic of a great leader is to, to look at reality and face it honestly Right? right and 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 to say this is my current state but also what a leader does is keep an eye towards where he's trying to get the group to go but they so they so in in you almost have to have two two lenses of the world right you face reality this is my current situation you know we're last in market share but our hope and dreams and our aspirations and what we're working towards is to be number one in market share and here's how we're going to get there so you have those two lenses on the world at all times yeah, but and, if you uh, don't have the if you don't have the where you are, you can never get that's there. That's exactly right. But if you don't have that, you know that 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 you know grasp of of reality, you're going to get yourself in real trouble because you're going to think that you're better than you really are, or potentially worse than you really are, right? So, but you have a distorted view of reality. So, I think good leaders have a good handle on reality, but they also sort of keep an eye on where they want to go or where they want to take the organization. Well, that's what gets to the next the next stage is the challenges because mm. leaders always have challenges, and I found that all the challenges can easily be lumped into one of three categories. Okay, the one that is most often 
the issue is missed expectations. Mm. Somebody has an expectation for you or you have an expectation for you or somebody and it doesn't happen. And so the next question is, well, why? Yeah. Well, there's only three reasons expectations don't happen. Somebody doesn't know what to do. Somebody doesn't know how to do it or have the means and time and resources to get it done. Or they don't want to. Mm. Now, the only one that belongs to the individual who's got the assignment is the wanna. The leader is responsible for the what. The leader is responsible for the how. And the leader is responsible for knowing that those people to whom those assignments are given know what it is they need to do, how to do it, or have the training to do it, and have the resources to do it. If you're asking somebody to do something they're not capable of doing, you're a crummy leader. Now, you can yeah. have, you can have, you can explain in infinite detail what you want. But if they don't have the capability to do it and you're going to try to hold them responsible, then you're an idiot. Right, right. But how many times have you heard this, this kind of thing? Well, my job as the leader is not to tell everybody what to do my, or how to do things. My job is to tell them what needs to be done. It's up to them to figure out how. Yeah. What, you, what you've just done is you've just declared for the entire world what a lousy leader you are. Mm. Because if you don't know how they're going to get it done, then you got no business giving them the assignment. Mm, okay. So the the how and the what belong to the leader. The wanna belongs to the individual. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, now I don't know very many people who come to work saying, you know what, I want to just suck at work today. <laughs> I think people come to work because they want to do something. Yes. So it's awfully rare that people come to work mm. with a bad attitude, not wanting to do things. Mm. So when things don't happen. The first place you need to look is to the leader. And if you are the leader, the first place you need to look is in the mirror mm. because that's the thing. The second thing on the challenge is ethical conflicts. And when you have an ethical conflicts, there's no win. Everybody gets hurt. But you have three choices. You can fix the problem. You can accept the problem if you can't fix it. Or you can leave, get out of it. Those are the three things that are part of the uh, the serenity prayer, if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. Lord, grant me the courage to things change the things I can, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm. So those are the things for when you get into an ethical challenge. And I give some examples. And the one I give that's most powerful in the book is the My Lai incident in Vietnam, where uh, a platoon lieutenant was wasting a village because he claims that he was told to do that. Uh, and it turns out a chopper pilot set down his chopper between the villagers and the, the lieutenant's men and told his machine gunners on his chopper to shoot anybody that took one more step forward. Mm. So he actually fixed the problem initially. But now he had to deal with the, the, the problem right. of, of, of all that. And the person who did it had to deal with the problem. So fix it, leave it, or accept it, or leave it. It's the three things. Mm. But one thing you can't do, and I'll, t I'll tell you the fourth one that people often do, the one that should not be allowed, and when I do this, you're going to instantly recognize the name of somebody you personally know. <laughs> I guarantee you, because there's always somebody who doesn't fix the problem. There's always somebody who doesn't accept the problem. There's always, and they they choose not to leave the problem. So what do they do? They hang around and bitch about it. Mm, yeah, and yeah. you know who I'm talking about right now. You got a picture yeah, in your mind yeah, of yeah. more than one at least person you know who does yeah, that. They just kind of complain. People who do that. Yeah, people who do that are a cancer to themselves and to the organization, and there's only one cure for cancer, excision. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Deep Leadership is brought to you by Strikeforce Energy. Strikeforce Energy is a veteran-owned company founded by a Navy SEAL, and their products are all made in the USA. Strikeforce Energy is a liquid flavor pack that you can add into any beverage. It has zero calories, zero carbs, and zero sugar. Each pack contains 80 milligrams of caffeine. Strikeforce Energy is offering a discount to all the listeners of Deep Leadership. Go to strikeforceenergy.com and enter the discount code I have the watch, one word, for a 20% discount on every order. Deep Leadership is also brought to you by my Amazon best-selling book I Have the Watch, Becoming a Leader Worth Following. This book is filled with 23 short stories on how you can become a more effective leader. It's super easy to read, and most people finish it in less than two hours. 
Go to IHaveTheWatch.com and click the large orange button for signed copies. Enter the discount code IHaveTheWatch, one word, at checkout for 20% off your order and domestic shipping is always free. Third thing in the challenges that I describe in the book is one I think is one of the most important. It's right in the middle of the diagram of the picture. Uh, and it's in big red letters. It says, drive despair out. I love this. When I saw it, I, that's the one thing that uh, really triggered me. So drive despair out. What does that mean? Well, the way I uh, go about it is I ask people what to give me a definition of love. And I tell them my definition of love is this. Love is an overwhelming emotion that compels you to act for the benefit of others. So then I ask them, what's the opposite of love? Mm. Usually people will say hate. But it's not. But yeah. it's not. Yeah. Because hate is also a powerful emotion that compels you to act towards right. others, only it's to their detriment. Correct. The opposite of love is a powerful emotion that prevents you from operating. Mm. or acting towards others. And the word for that is despair. When you're in despair, you can't lead. When you're in despair, you can't follow. And so being able to recognize that in yourself and recognize it in others is a key thing for a leader so they can take actions to try to minimize the effect of despair on people's lives. And this hit home for me when I was in the Navy because at 2.30 in the morning, my wife rolled over after answering the phone and gave me the phone and I answered and I said, hello, Mr. Mays. Yeah. Well, this is Petty Officer, whatever. I'm not going to mention the name. I said, <laughs> I said well, what's up? He says, I'm going to kill my wife. Oh boy. Well, you know, he was in despair. Yeah. Because he'd been sent home early that night. We were on port and starboard 12 hour watches. He'd been sent home early because we didn't need to do some tests. And I always told people when they left home, left early, I said, call home, tell them you're coming home. Well, he didn't. Mm. so somebody else was there when he got there yeah yeah so he was in despair but he called me and i recognized that i have to do something to help this guy get out of despair mm. and so i told him i gave him an order to go to the boat and i said if you've been drinking and i said you've been drinking haven't you and he said yes sir i said call a cab get in the cab go to the boat i will pay for it or somebody will pay for it when you get there just go so we got in there in the middle of the evening, uh, me and his chief, I called his chief and we got him in there and we put him in his bunk and we told everybody to leave him alone. Don't, don't get him up for quarters, nothing. Just leave him back. Put him up in the morning. We got some food into him. We got some coffee into him. We started talking to him about things. We got him the help that he needed. But that for me was a critical item because if you're trying to read a leadership book that's 345 pages long and you try to say, well, was that on page 153 or on Mm. page 237? You're lost. You're done. Right. You have to be able to recognize that driving despair out is one of your fundamental duties as a leader and you're under fundamental challenges. I don't think I've ever heard that in any other leadership book. And I'm glad you bring it up because I think what I see a lot of cases, you know, you talk about um, employee engagement, right? Being so low. Well, part of it is despair. A lot of, a lot of people feel like they have no control over their circumstances. They have a bad boss. They're in a bad circumstance. They can't get a promotion. They feel like they don't have any control over the situation. And, um, and, and the leader's not doing anything to alleviate that despair, right? And so oh, they're disengaged. And exactly. I see despair as a big issue. I hear people talk about their jobs. I mean, being a leader guy, you know, leader right, leadership writer, and, and I've been, I, I enjoy the topic of leadership. I always listen to people tell stories about their work and their bosses. And despair is a big issue I hear when, I mean, I don't, I don't think I ever called it despair, but when you, when I read your words of despair, I said, well, that's exactly what it is that these people yeah. are facing. They feel and like yeah. they're not in control. Yeah, and it, it's something you have to actively work at every day. Mm. Um, uh, there was an old, um, in Jewish tradition, there was an old uh, uh, tradition that when you got out of bed in the morning, when your feet hit the floor, you would stand up, you would clap your hand loudly and say, thanks be to God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be thankful and rejoice in it. So right. that was a that was a 
ritual of driving despair out. Mm, interesting. And so I was interested in that. And so I, I found that if you just look a little bit and pay a little bit of attention, you will see when despair is coming into people's lives, whether it's needless paperwork or mm -hmm. overburdened activities yes. or some other externality like my, my car got wrecked, my dog's died, my wife wants to divorce me, whatever. You will, if you pay attention to people, they will let you know they're in despair. You'll, mm. It'll be hard not to see it. You almost have to actively not go looking for it to miss it. Yeah. But the problem is, is that many, many, I would say bosses, not leaders, many bosses are not present. So they're, they're, they're sequestered in their office or in a conference room somewhere. They're not present to witness that, or they don't have that relationship with the people. So they do, they miss it because they're not, they don't have any empathy and they don't, um, they, they have no relationship with their people. That's why, you know, I think these, like you said, you have to be blind not to see it, but, but there are many bosses out there that don't have that relationship with the people that they work with. So they don't, they don't see it. And that person is continuously in despair and nothing ever gets addressed. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's why one of the things I noticed about leaders that do things and leaders that don't do things, uh, as we were talking about before we started the show, when there was an issue with our uh, weapons things, my squadron commander recognized that, that uh, despair was setting in and said, let's go have some fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we ch he, he changed, this, he changed, he changed the situation. He changed my, the situation. My, he sensed the my, despair. Yeah. My commanding officer, when he told me he wanted me to take the engineer's exam, uh, didn't recognize the despair. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's and a great he, example. Yeah. He, yeah. he caused it. Yeah. He caused it. He foisted it on me and he refused to take any responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. So I was faced with the ethical challenge. I could fix it. I couldn't. I couldn't accept it. So I left. Right, that's, right. that's how, that's how that happened to me. And that's wow. how those things ended up in the book. Wow. So that's, so, that's, so let's the look last at the, level. the last level is underneath the, the drawing. It's, it's, uh, no, it's achieved. It's a, oh no, sorry. Achieve is the top of the drawing. Sorry. Top of the drawing right. right. And so three things in the, in the achievement thing, if you've accomplished the foundation, you're, you're dealing with the challenges, you have three things that will really jumpstart achievement. The first one is assist. I call it mm -hmm. a AID. The first one is assist. The leader helps people do the things that they need to get done. Mm -hmm. He's looking for ways to make them successful and looking to assist them. The next one is he's looking to inspire them. He wants them to all feel that what they do is important, whether it's the, 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 the lowest point in the salary scale or the, the near top. He wants everybody to recognize their contribution and how it affects success for everybody. So the inspiring part. And the last one that so many leaders don't do is depend on people because you can't do it all yourself. If you could do it all yourself, you wouldn't need followers. And so you have to learn to depend on other people. And that means you have to recognize that as a leader, things are going to go right sometimes that you don't have anything to do with. Things are going to go wrong sometimes that you don't have anything to do with. But regardless of which one it is, it's still your responsibility. If it's successful, you should be telling people who were helped you get there that you were depending on, I, this was a success because I depended on you and you came through. Mm -hmm. If it's a failure, your leader has to come up and say, I failed you. Here's the things we need to do so that we won't have this problem again. But too many times I see leaders who take what I refer to, I refer to them as comma, but leaders, which. Uh, which ah, is, okay. I, I figured that out. <laughs> but because, because yeah. they always say, I accept full responsibility, comma. comma, but, and then they explain why it's not their fault. Mm. And I'm sorry, good leaders don't do that. Yeah. I had that conversation with uh, Admiral Kelso when the hook situation came up in the Navy. And I, I wrote a letter to him talking to him about some of the things he had done for me, trying to cheer him up and tell him about how I recognized uh, his, you know, I, I felt like he was getting unfairly attacked and I wanted him to know that somebody else had his six, mm. even, even a little bit. Yeah. And he wrote back to me and he said something that was very profound. He said, he said, thank you very much. I remember very fondly there are interactions when I was with the oh, squadron. Wow. 
he says, he says, but I'm the boss and these things were going on on my watch. So it's up to me to take the responsibility for them. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that made Kelso in my mind, a yes. very, very high level leader. Yeah. Somebody that I wanted to be around and, and work with, but, uh, you know, sometimes as the, the saying goes, it happens. Right. Well, it's interesting that you say that uh, responsibility because I, I I touched on this in my new book that's coming out a little later this year. But I talk about one thing I learned in the Navy was, you know, that the leader took responsibility, but he delegated authority. So we would delegate right. authority, as you said, to depend on, on others. Right. So you would give them the authority to get the job done. But ultimately, you maintain the responsibility for the ship, the crew, the mission, right? So it's your fault if anything goes wrong, right? But you, but you give the people the tools to have the authority to get the job done. And I felt very strongly that that's the way I was led in my time in the Navy. What I found when I came into the civilian workforce was that we do just the opposite. So we, um, we delegate responsibility and we keep all the authority to ourselves, a lot, of, a lot of bosses. So they say, if something goes wrong, they blame the people underneath them, right? Oh, you, you screwed up, you messed up, and you throw them under the bus. And then, uh, but they keep all, but then they keep all the tools, all the authority to themselves. And so people aren't empowered. They don't have the tools they need to, to be successful. And if anything goes, goes wrong, it's their fault. And so I saw, I saw I saw a lot of that in corporate America, which was drive just the opposite. In. They were driving to spare in. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, and I use this analogy. I said, you if you want to be successful in leadership, you have to accept the consequence that there are no win scenarios. Sometimes, yes, you have to accept them anyway. Yes, uh, and you, the the way I the analogy I use is is that uh, authority. And uh, responsibility that authority is a lot like love. You get the most out of it when you give it away. Mm, if you hoard yeah. it, yeah. you don't get what you want. Right. If you give it away, right. you get you get rewarded tremendously. Yeah. And so when you're when you're holding on to that power and you're holding on to that authority, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. But when you give it away, not only are you helping others you're also helping yourself mm, but that's a difficult thing to do to get people to do because nobody wants to be held accountable for anything that goes wrong because that yeah. makes you feel bad about yourself so right. they want to have control well the myth is that if you just keep control of everything you won't have a problem and the answer yeah. is no if you keep no. control of everything you're guaranteed to have a problem absolutely yeah and that's the that's the thing i know good leaders depend on other people by delegating authority and maintaining responsibility. Excellent. And uh, so those are the kinds of things I just noticed over time. And I thought, you know, this, there's got to be a way of putting these things together so they're not so hard for people to see. Yeah. Well, now, now that you've walked through the elements in the drawing, now I, I can see where I'm going to fit all every situation into this model. Now I can see where uh, it's a great visual representation of what, what, you know, these, these leadership elements. Yeah. So don't think uh, of an elephant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't think of an elephant. Now I'm going to remember this picture in my head. So, um, so what, um, how can people get this book? Where is it available? How can they get it? Uh, the book's available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, you can get it there. You can get it as a hardcover or soft cover or a, an ebook. Um, uh, you can also get a lot of the information about what's in the book uh, in encapsulated form uh on my website power of three leadership.com okay that's p-o-w-e-r the number three leadership.com and it doesn't matter whether you spell three or write the number three it'll still get you there okay and i have put many of the lessons that I, and stories that i have in the book on the website as lessons and i've also written additional lessons since the book has come out about things and events that have occurred that I use the power three paradigm as my, my prism for examining uh, problems that occur. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've heard the story uh, uh, about a year, two years ago, a, a young man who was a uh, football player for the university of Maryland and was out running uh, uh, 110 sprints uh, in full pads and gear and suffered heat exhaustion and, and died. 
And uh, so one of the one of the things I wrote on the uh, website was, uh, where did leadership fail? Mm. And by looking at all the different aspects of what was in the power of three paradigm, you could see that leadership failed in this young man's life to cause him to die every step of the way. Wow. Every single place, there was a place where you could say, this is where leadership failed. Mm. And uh, it became so obvious to me that this was the tool to use to see when things go wrong. But it's also the tool to use to say, what do I need to do that's right? Because when you're giving a job and you've got a boss and you've got a timetable and you've got a schedule, it's so easy to get involved in all that stuff that you don't take time to sit back and say, how am I doing as a leader? Mm. What are the areas I am spending my time and devoting my attention to, to help me be a better leader? How am I handling challenges? Am I handling them in a way that fixes them? Or I'm handling them in a way that causes an ethical conflict? Or am I handling them in a way that causes despair to be sown within my group? Um, and then you say, if you beyond that, you say, what have I done today? For example, if you're the leader of a, of a, a department of a company or, or a large company or whatever, what have I done today to assist my company in achieving our goals? What have I done today to inspire somebody, anybody, who, to be more willing to put forth effort to reach our goals? What have I done today to depend on people? Um, it's, a, it's an amazing thing uh, when you talk to leaders, especially leaders of large organizations, and you ask them, what's the most important things? They'll tell you like three or four different things. Well, then what you do is you go and you check their emails. And you look at every email they've sent out over the past month and see how many times that email addressed any of those three things that they said was important. And when you show that to them, they go, holy cow, yeah. I'm all wrapped in these details and I'm forgetting to do these things. And these are the things I'm telling everybody is important and I'm not doing them. Yeah. Yeah. I call this a, the busy, the busy manager, the too busy to do, to lead. Yeah. yeah, They become too busy and too engrossed in things to be able to do that until, until a disaster occurs that requires their attention. And then all their attention is about going around and finding out who did what and everything. I, I, I use the example that accountability in America is a six syllable synonym for blame mm. accountability really has the root word count yeah in, in its in its core and that means you see what the situation is and you count up what went right and what went wrong and what needs to happen so it's the counting and the deciding it's not about blame mm. um michael Crichton in his book the rising sun uh has this character who sean connery played in the movie who was engrossed in Japanese culture. And he, he tells his young assistant, played by Lee Snipes, that who's a, and they're both policemen. He says, you know, here's the issue. In Japan, when there's a problem, we fix the problem. Mm. In America, when there's a problem, we fix the blame. Yeah, true. And so accountability is not about fixing blame. Accountability is about fixing the problem. The problem, yeah. And that's something that if you're a busy manager, busy leader, and you don't have time to practice leadership, eventually a disaster will occur. And then all your attention is focused on fixing the blank. Yeah, right. And, it, right. It, and that just becomes a, 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 an, an exercise in driving despair in. It becomes an exercise in not depending on people by gathering more authority to yourself so you can try to make those things not happen again. It, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's the problem with uh, uh, not having a, a picture or a paradigm for leadership. I mean, you graduated from the academy. How many formal leadership classes did you take when you were there? Yeah, that's a thing. I mean, we took a lot of leadership classes even before we stepped foot on the boats, you know. So that's, that's interesting. So, and you know, uh, how many I, you know how many I took? No, I, no. Zero. Oh, okay, okay. We didn't even... They didn't have a Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership when I was at the mm. academy. There was no leadership department. It was not there. So everything you had to learn, you had to learn by just getting thrown in with the sharks and seeing yeah. if you could get out of the pool. Yeah. Well, but, most uh, uh, most MBA programs, I, I, I teach sometimes at uh, I teach leadership at MBA programs, and and uh, I, I asked them. I said, "How much training have you had in leadership?" 
And they're like, this is the first time I come in there and do an hour lecture. And that's the most they get in uh, two and a half years of uh, studying. So they study accounting, marketing, sales, uh, everything but um, leadership. And what do they need the most? They're stepping into a leadership role. They need to know how to deal with people and make decisions. And so it's just really interesting that um, we we want we expect people to we expect people who are good at doing their their job doing a their own personal job to just naturally be leaders well leadership is a whole different set of skills and i think what i like about what you've done is you're trying to define what those skills look like in a way yes. and, and in a way and a, and, a, and a leadership model that you can go to and kind of understand oh this is where i am in the model this is where i'm this is where i need to work on so i think i think what you've done is pretty um which is exceptional because I don't think anyone else has tried to build a model like this. I don't know if anybody has or not. And there, there may be some, and I'm not so uh, stupid or self uh, absorbed that I believe it's the only, I'm, I've got the only model out there. I use an example in my book from a math thing, cause I'm a math major. I said, uh, if you go on the Cartesian plane, you can get to a point one comma one, which is one step down the X axis and one step up the Y axis and you reach that point. But if you're not a Cartesian, if you're a polar person, you get to the same exact point by going to square root of two pi over four. Now you may have to think about that a little bit to remember your trigonometry, <laughs> but polar coordinates are a, a magnitude and an angle. Yeah, but they have the exact. They end up in the exact same place as going one step out, one and one step up. Goes to the same place as saying I'm going square root of two distance, and I'm going to rotate it from my origin axis to pi over four radians, and I will get to the exact same place. Mm. So there may be other models, and there may be other ways of getting to these all the things that are in my power three paradigm. So I'm not willing, I'm not trying to claim that I have the only way of looking at this, but I do know that I haven't found anybody else who comes at it from this perspective and has written about it that, that I've been able to find. Stephen Covey kind of comes close with seven habits. Um, uh, John Wooden, the legendary uh, mm -hmm. coach, he wrote about his pyramid of success, which had uh, 15 blocks in it and 12 principles underneath it. That's more than I can memorize. Uh, and uh, some other people have done things uh, like, like that. Um, Simon Sinek talks about understanding your why, and then you work on your how, and then you get around to your what. And I'm more long, I'm working in the what realm. I'm saying, I don't really care what your why is. And I don't really care what your how is. I want to know what it is you do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm on the results side of that. Uh, so there are other ways of looking at it, but I think you'll find if you just take a random sample of leadership books, what you find in so often is one or two elements of what's in the power of three paradigm and a lot of different things about style and personality about how to do that. Right. And that's, I think that's a mistake. I think yeah. you need to be able to have something that is, uh, at least as much as you can make it complete and, it has to be both complete and it has to be comprehensive and structured in a way that you can see what it is and be, it'd be usable because yeah, you, can't, you can't model everything. It's not possible. No, no, I think this is a good, what you've done is uh, is a good attempt to bring this all together in one place. So the book is the power of three lessons in leadership. It's available and we're going to put links on, uh, on the show notes just so we can get to uh, your website, get to the book sales, uh, any of the social media links, we'll get, get that all set up. So um, this is, Stephen, this has been great. I really appreciate your your time. I appreciate all the wisdom that you shared. I mean, I think there's some powerful things. The one thing I keep standing out in my mind is that our leader's job is to drive despair out. And uh, I think we don't do that enough. I think in corporate America, there's a lot of despair and uh, we're focused on the wrong things sometimes. So uh, if you just take away one thing from this uh, podcast, please drive despair out. <laughs> but also go get this book because um, I think it's going to give you a, a good model to focus your leadership actions on. So, Stephen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
So that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care.